All right, we are live. So this is going to be Aristotle's Politics, Book One. Um, last thing that we read was uh, Nicomachean Ethics, Book One. So I'm interested in seeing how uh, Book One of Politics follows. Um, Nicomachean Ethics, let's see, uh, that first book we kind of discovered, uh, it's, it's really just about what is justice, kind of kind of trying to figure that out. Um, a lot of his ethics were based on like the existence of a soul. Um, all human activities aim at some good, some good subordinate to others. Um, in politics, we're going to look at, uh, if you're looking at the contents anyway, that's the short description. So the state of the highest form of community. Um, oh, okay. So basically book one is a definition in the structure of the state is what we're going after. Um, book one for Nicomachean ethics was the good for man. So what is good for man? And now we're looking at the definition of, and the structure of the state. So um, hopefully this goes well. I got a slightly new setup. I got some new, I'll show you, you see the, some sound stuff in my room uh, or in my office rather. All right, cool. Here are politics book one. Every state is a community of some kind, and every community is established with a view to some good. For mankind, mankind always act in order to obtain that which they think good. But if all communities aim at some good, the state or political community, which is the highest of all, and which embraces all the rest, aims at good in a greater degree than any other, and at the highest good. Some people think, that the qualifications of a statesman, king, householder, and master are, are the same, and that they differ not in kind, but only in the number of their subjects. For example, the ruler over a few is called a master, over more, the manager of a household, over a still larger number, a statesman or king, as if there was no difference between a great household and a small one, or uh, sorry, as if there's no difference between a great household and a small state. The distinction is made between the king and the statesman is as follows. When the government is personal, the ruler is king. When, according to the rules of a, the political science, the citizens rule and are ruled in turn, then he is called a statesman. But all this is a mistake, for governments differ in kind, as will be evident, evident to anyone who considers the matter according to the method which has hitherto guided us. As in the other departments of science, so in pol uh, as in other departments of science, so in politics, the compound should always be resolved into the simple elements or, or least parts of the whole. We must therefore look at the elements of which the state is composed in order that we may see in what the different kinds of rule differ from one another and whether any scientific result can be attained about each one of them. So we have kind of this um, compositional um, approach. So if we make the assumption that the state is a composition of such things, then we can break it apart and discover more about it. Um, I'm going to turn on this fan really quick. Whew, this is getting a little bit warm in here. <laughs> All right, so uh, we're going to break apart the whole and look at it in parts. All right, part two. He who thus considers things in their first growth and origin whether a state or anything else will obtain the clearest view of them. In the first place, there must be a union of those who cannot exist without each other, namely of male and female, that the race may continue. And this is a union which is formed not of deliberate purpose, but because in common with other animals and with plants, mankind have a natural desire to leave behind, uh, leave behind them an image of themselves and of natural ruler and subject that both may be preserved. For that which can foresee by the exercise of mind is by nature intended to be lord and master, and that which can with its body give effect to such foresight is a subject and by nature a slave. Hence master and slave have the same interest. Now nature has distinguished between the, the female and the slave, for she is not, uh, you know, it's a, there's a questionable word here if you're reading along. Uh, you'll see it. Uh, so she's not, I think lowly is, is the word. I'll just say lowly if I see that. Like the smith who uh, fashions the Delphian knife for many uses. She makes each thing for a single use. And every instrument is best made when intended for one and not for many uses. But among barbarians, no distinction is made between women and slaves. 
because there is no natural ruler among them. They are a community of slaves, male and female. Wherefore, the poets say it is, it is meet that Hellens should rule over barbarians, as if they thought that the barbarian and the slave were by nature one. Out of these two relationships between man and woman, master and slave, the first thing to arise is the family. And Hesiod is right when he says, first house and wife and an ox for the plow, for the plough, for the ox is a poor man's slave. The family is the association established by nature for the supply of men's everyday wants. And the members of it are called by the Sharonda's companions of the cupboard and by Epimenides, the Cretan, companions of the manger. But when several families are united and the association aims at something more than the supply of daily needs, the first society to be formed is the village. And the most natural form of the village appears to be that of a colony from that family or from the family. Most natural form of a village appears to be that of a colony from the family composed of the children and grandchildren who are said to be suckled with the same milk. And this is the reason why Hel Hellenic states were originally governed by kings, because the Hellens were under royal rule before they came together, as the barbarians still are. Every family is ruled by the eldest, and therefore in the colonies of the family, and the kingly form of government prevailed because they were of the same blood. As Homer says, each one gives law to his children and to his wives. For they lived... Uh, dispersedly, and was the manner in ancient times. Wherefore, men say that the gods have a king, because they themselves either are or were in ancient times under the rule of a king. For they imagine, uh, for they imagine not only the forms of the rich, but their ways of life to be like their own. When several villages are united in a single complete community, large enough to be nearly or quite self-sufficing, the state comes into existence originating in the bare needs of life and continuing in existence for the sake of a good life. And therefore, if the earlier forms of society are natural, so is the state. For, for it is the end of them, and the nature of a thing is its end. For what each thing is when fully developed, we call its nature, whether we are speaking of a man, a horse, or a family. Besides, the final cause and end of a thing is the best, and to be self-sufficing is the end and the best. Hence, it is evident that the state is a creation of nature and that man is by nature a political animal. And he who by nature and not by mere accident is without a state is either a bad man or above humanity. He is like the tribeless, uh, lawless, hearthless one whom Homer denounces. The natural outcast is forthwith a lover of war. He may be compared to an isolated piece at droughts. I'm going to be interested to see if Aristotle uh, defends this position in any way. Uh, so, so if somebody is not part of society, that he is a bad man. Um, I'm wondering how that fits in with his view of ethics. <laughs> now, that man is more of a political animal than bees or any other gregarious animals is evident. Nature, as we often say, makes nothing in vain, and man is the only animal whom she has endowed with the gift of speech. And whereas mere voice is but an indication of pleasure or pain, and is therefore found in other animals, for their nature attains to the perception of pleasure and pain and the uh, uh, intimation of them to one another, and no further, the power of speech is intended to set forth the expedient and inexpedient, and therefore, likewise, the just and the unjust. And it is a characteristic of man that he alone has any sense of good and evil, of just and unjust, and the like. And the association of living beings who have this sense makes a family and a state. Further, the state is by nature clearly prior to the family and to the individual, since the whole is of necessity prior to the part. For example, if the whole body be destroyed, there will be no foot or hand except in an equivocal sense, as we might speak of a stone hand. For when destroyed, the hand will be no better than that. But things are defined by their working in power. And we ought not to say that they are the same when they no longer have their proper quality, but only that they have the same name. The proof that the state is a creation of nature and prior to the individual is that the individual, when isolated, is not self-sufficing, and therefore he is like a part in relation to the whole. But he who is unable to live in society or who has no need because he is sufficient for himself must be either a beast or a god. He is no part of a state. 
A social instinct is implanted in all men by nature, and yet he who first founded the state was the greatest of benefactors. For man, when perfected, is the best of animals, but when separated from law and justice, he is the worst of all, since armed injustice is the more dangerous, and he is equipped at birth with arms, meant to be used by intelligence and virtue, which he may use for the worst ends. Wherefore, if he have not virtue, he is the most unholy and the most savage of animals, and the most full of lust and gluttony. But justice is the bond of men and states, and the administration of justice, which is the determination of what is just, is the principle of order in political society. So justice is the bond of men and states. Ba, 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 ba. Uh, okay. Seeing then, we're in section three now, seeing then that the state is made up of households before speaking of the state, we must speak of the management of the household. The parts of household management correspond to the persons who compose the household, and a complete household consists of, state, of slaves and freemen. Now, we should, be, we should begin by examining everything in its fewest possible elements. And the first and fewest uh, possible parts of a family are master and slave, husband and wife, father and children. We have therefore to consider what each of these three relations is and ought to be. I mean, the relation of master and servant, the marriage relation, the conjunction of a man and woman has no name of its own. And thirdly, the uh, procreative relation that it uh, this also has no proper name. And there is another element of a household, the so-called art of getting, getting wealth, which, according to some, is identical with household management, according to others, a principal part of it. The nature of this art will, uh, will also have to be considered by us. Let us first, uh, first speak of master and slave, looking to the needs of practical life and also seeking to attain some better theory of the relation that exists at present. For some are of the opinion that the ruler of a master is a science and that the management of a household and the mastership of slaves and the political and royal rule, as I was saying at the outset, are all the same. Others affirm that the rule of a master over slaves is contrary to nature and that the distinction between slave and free men uh, exists by law only and not by nature, and being in interference with nature is therefore unjust. So it's interesting that Aristotle seems to be wrestling with the idea that slavery is uh, maybe immoral somehow. Maybe he got to that uh, because it's like against our nature. So here's a pre-biblical idea of what that is. All right, part four. Property is a part of the household and the art of acquiring property is a part of the art of managing the household. For no man can live well, or indeed live at all, unless he be provided with necessaries. And as in the arts which have a definite sphere, the workers must have their own proper instruments for the accomplishments of their work. So it is in the management of a household. Now instruments are of various sorts. Some are living, others lifeless in the rudder. The pilot of a ship has a lifeless in the lookout man, uh, a living instrument, for in the arts the servant is a kind of instrument. Thus, too, a possession is an instrument for maintaining life. And so, in the arrangement of the family, a slave is a living possession, and property a number of such instruments, and the servant is himself an instrument which takes precedent of all other instruments. For if every instrument could accomplish its own work, obeying or anticipating the will of others, like the statues of uh, Daedalus or the tripods of uh, Hephaestus, which, says the poet, of their own accord entered the assembly of the gods. Um, if, in like man manner, the shuttle would weave and the plectrum touch the lyre without a hand to guide them, chief workmen would not want servants nor master slaves. Here, however, another distinction must be drawn. The instruments commonly so called are instruments of production, while a possession is an instrument of action. The shuttle, for example, is not only of use, but something else is made by it. Whereas of a garment or of a bed, there's only the use. Further, as production and action are different in kind and both require instruments, the instruments which they employ must likewise differ in kind. But life is action and not production, and therefore the slave is the minister of action. Again, a possession is spoken of as a part is spoken of. For the part is not only a part of something else, but wholly belongs to it. And this is also true of a possession. The master is only the master of the slave. He does not belong to him, whereas the slave is not only the slave of his master, but wholly belongs to him. Hence, we see what is the nature and office of a slave. He, he who is by nature, not his own, but another man's, is by nature a slave. And he may be said to be another's man, who, being a human being, is also a possession. And a possession may be defined as an instrument of action, separable from the possessor. It's a mouthful and 
I'm not really quite sure what to think at this point. Uh, book number five, or section number five of book one. But is there anyone thus intended by nature to be a slave and for whom such a condition is expedient and right and rather is not all, all slavery a violation of nature? There we go. Uh, there's no difficulty in answering this question on grounds of both of reason and of fact. For that some should rule and others be ruled is a thing not only necessary but expedient. From the hour of their birth, some are marked out for subjection, others for rule. And there are many kinds, both of rulers and subjects, that and that rule is the uh, is the better, which is ex exercised over better subjects. For example, to rule over men is better than to rule over wild beasts. For the work is better, which is executed by better workmen. And where one man rules and another is ruled, they may be said to have a work. Continuing the sentence. For in all things which form a composite whole and which are made up of parts, whether continuous or discrete, a distinction between the ruling and the subject element comes to light. Such a duality exists in living creatures, but not in them only. It originates in the constitution of the universe. Even in things which have no life, there is a ruling principle, as in a musical mode. But we are wandering from the subject. We will therefore restrict ourselves to the living creature, which, in the first place, consists of soul and body. And of these two, the one is uh, by nature the ruler, and the other the subject. But then we must look for the intentions of nature in things which retain their nature, and not in things which, which are corrupted. And therefore, we must study the man who is in the most perfect state, both of the body and soul. For him we shall, uh, for in him we shall see the true relation of the two. Although in bad or corrupted natures of the body will often appear to rule over the soul, because they, they are in, in an evil and unnatural condition. At all events, we may firstly observe in living creatures both a despotical and a constitutional rule, for the soul rules the body with a, a despotical rule, whereas the intellect rules the appetites with a constitutional and royal rule. And it is clear that the rule of the soul over the body and the mind and the rational um, element over the passionate is natural and expedient, whereas the equality of the two or the rule of the inferior is always hurtful. The same holds good of animals in relation to men, for tame animals have a better nature than wild, and all tame animals are better off when they are ruled by man, for then they are preserved. Again, the male is by nature superior and the female inferior, and the one rules and the other is ruled. This principle of necessity extends to all mankind. Where the uh, where then there is such a difference as that between soul and body or between men and animals, as in the case of those whose business is to use their body and who can do nothing better, the lower sort are by nature slaves, and it is better for them as for all inferiors that they should be under the rule of a master. For he who can be and therefore is in others, and he who participates in rational principle through a uh, principle enough to apprehend but not to have such a principle is a slave by nature. Is Aristotle's justifying slavery here? I'll have to see some more educated uh, summaries of this. All right. Whereas the lower animals cannot even apprehend a principle, they obey their instincts. And indeed, the use made of slaves and of tame animals is not very different, for both with their bodies minister to the needs of life. Nature would like to distinguish between the bodies of free men and slaves, making the one strong for servile, servile labor, the other upright, and although useless for such services, useful for political life and the arts, both of war and peace. But the opposite often happens, that some have the, uh, that some have the souls and others have the body of free, uh, bodies of free men. And doubtless if men differed from one another in the mere forms of their bodies as much as the statue, uh, statues of the gods do for men, all would acknowledge that the inferior class should be slaves of the sup superior. And if this, is uh, if this is true of the body, how much more just that a similar distinction should exist in the soul. But the beauty of the body is seen, whereas the beauty of the soul is not seen. It is clear then that some men are by nature free and other slaves, and that for these latter, slavery is both expedient and right. <laughs> what do you do with that? <laughs> Ben learned something new today.
All right, part six. But that those who take the opposite view have a certain way right on their side may be easily seen. Okay, here's arguing the other side. <laughs> For the words slavery and slave are used in two senses. There is a slave or slavery by law as well as by nature. So we have a slavery of law and we have a slavery of, of nature. So he's argued for slavery by nature, and now he, maybe he, here's a, maybe here's going to be a description of uh, law. We'll see. The law of which I speak is the sort of convention uh, is a sort of convention. The law by which whatever is taken in war is supposed to be uh, supposed to belong to the victors. But this right, many jurists impeach as they would an orator who brought forward an unconstitutional measure. They detest the notion that because one man has the power of doing violence and is superior in brute strength and that another shall be his slave and subject. Yeah, just because you went a war, should the people you had victory over belong to you as possessions? That's the question. Even among philosophers, there's a difference of opinion. The origin of the dispute and what makes the views invade each other's territory is as follows. In some sense, virtue, when furnished with means, has actually the greatest power of exercising force, and as superior power is only found where there is superior excellence of some kind, power seems to imply virtue, and the dispute to be simply one about justice, for it is due to one party identifying justice with goodwill, while the other identifies it with the mere rule of the stronger. If these views are thus set out separately, the other views have no force or plausibility against the view that the superior in virtue ought to rule or be master. Others clinging, as they think, simply to a principle of justice for law and custom or a sort of justice, assume that, the, that slavery in accordance with the custom of war is justified by law. But at the same moment, they, de they deny this. For what if, what if the cause of war be unjust? And again, no one would ever say... Um, no one would ever say that he is a slave who is unworthy to be a slave. Were this the case, men of the highest rank would be slaves, and the children of slaves, if they or their parents chanced to have been taken captive and sold. Wherefore, Helens do not like to call Helens slaves, but confine the term to barbarians. Yet, in using this language, they really mean the natural slave of whom we spoke at first. For it must be admitted that some are slaves everywhere, others nowhere. The same principle applies to nobility. Helens regard themselves as noble everywhere, and not only in their own country, but they deem the barbarians noble only when at home, thereby implying that there are two sorts of nobility and freedom, and the one absolute, the other relative. The Helen of the uh, Theodectes says... Who would presume to call me servant who am on both sides sprung from the stem of gods, of the gods? What does this mean but that they distinguish freedom and slavery, noble and humble birth, by the two principles of good and evil? They think that as men and animals beget men and animals, so from good men a good man springs. Oh, okay, so from a good man a good man springs. But this is what nature, though she may intend it, cannot always accomplish. Because we have outliers, right? We see then that there is some foundation for this difference of opinion and that all are neither slaves by nature or freemen by nature. And also that there is in some cases a marked distinction between the two classes, rendering it expedient and right for, for the one to be slaves and the others to be masters. The one practicing obedience and the others exercising the authority and lordship which nature intended them to have. The abuse of this authority is injurious to both. For the interests of part and whole of body and soul are the same, and the slave is a part of the master, a living but separated part of his bodily, uh, his bodily frame. Hence, where the relation of master and slave between them is natural, they are friends and have a common interest. But where it rests merely on law and force, the reverse is true. Part 7. The previous remarks are quite enough to show that the rule of a master is not a constitutional rule, and that all the different kinds of rule are not, as some affirm, the same with each other. For there is one rule exercised over subjects who are by nature free, another over subjects who are by nature slaves. The rule of a household is a monarchy, for every house is under one head. Whereas constitutional rule is a government of free men and equals, the master is not called a master because he has science, but because he is of a certain character. And this 
Same remark applies to the slave and to the freeman, or to the free man. Still, there may be science, uh, a science for the master and a science for the slave. The science of the slave would be such as the man of Syracuse taught, who made money by instructing slaves in their ordinary duties. And such a knowledge may be carried further so as to include cookery and similar menial arts. For some duties are of the more nece uh, necessary, others of the more honorable sort. As the proverb says, slave before slave, master before master. But all such branches of knowledge are servile. There is likewise a science of the master which teaches the use of slaves, for the master as such is concerned, not with the acquisition, but with the use of them. Yet this so-called science is not anything great or wonderful, for the master need only know how to order that which the slave must know how to execute. Hence, those who are in position which uh, places them above toil have stewards who attend the, to their households while they occupy themselves with philosophy or with politics. But the art of acquiring slaves, I mean of justly acquiring them, differs both from the art of the master and the art of the slave, being a species of hunting or war, enough of the distinction, uh, and that's the end of the idea, enough of the distinction between master and slave. Moving on. Part 8. Let us now inquire into property generally and into the art of getting wealth in accordance with our usual method for a slave has been shown to be a part of property. The first question is whether the art of getting wealth is the same uh, with the art of managing a household or a part of it or instrumental to it. And if the last, whether in the way that the art of making shuttles is instrumental to the art of weaving or that in the way of casting a bronze, uh, the casting of bronze is instrumental to the art of uh, statuary. For they are not instrumental in the same way, but the one provides tools and the other material. And by material, I mean this uh, substratum out of which any work is made. Thus, wool is the material of the weaver, bronze of the statuary. Now, it is easy to see that the art of household management is not identical with the art of getting wealth. For the one, who, uh, for the one uses the material which the other provides. For the art of which uses household stores can be no other than the art of household management. There is, however, a doubt whether the art of getting wealth is a part of household management or a distinct art. If the getter of wealth has to consider whence wealth and property can be procured, but there are many sorts of property and riches, then our husbandry and the care and provision of food in general, parts of the wealth getting art or distinct arts. Again, there are many sorts of food, and therefore there are many kinds of lives, both of animals and men. They must all have food, and the differences in their food have made differences in their ways of life. For of beasts, some are gregarious, others solitary. They live in the way which is best adapted to sustain them, accordingly as they are uh, carnivorous or herbivorous or omnivorous. And their habits are determined for them by nature in such a manner that they may obtain with greater facility the food of their choice. But as different species have different tastes, the same things are not naturally pleasant to all of them. And therefore the lives of carnivorous or herbivorous animals further differ among themselves. In the lives of men too, there is a great difference. The laziest are shepherds who lead an idle life and get their subsistence, uh, subsistence without trouble from tame animals. Their flocks having to wander from place to place in search of pasture, they are compelled to follow them, cultivating a sort of living farm. Others support themselves by hunting, which is of different kinds. Some, for example, are uh, brigands. Others who dwell near lakes or marshes or rivers or a sea in which there are fish are fishermen. And others live in the pursuit of birds or wild beasts. The greater number obtain a living from the cultivated fruits of the soil. Such are the modes of subsistence which prevail among those whose industry springs up of itself and whose food is not acquired by exchange and retail trade. There is the shepherd, the husbandman, the brigand, the fisherman, the hunter. Some gain a comfortable maintenance out of two employments, eking out the deficiencies of one of them by another. Thus the life of a shepherd may be combined with that of a brigand, the life of a farmer with that of a hunter. Other modes of life are similarly combined in any way which the needs of men may require. Property in the sense of a bare livelihood seems to be given by nature herself to all both when they are first born and when they are grown up. For some animals bring forth, together with their offspring, so much food as will last until they are able to supply themselves. Of this, the ver, uh, vermi, vermiparous or 
oviparous animals are an instance, and the viviparous animals have up to a certain time a supply of food for their young in themselves, which is called milk. In like manner, we may infer that after the birth of animals, plants exist for their sake and that other animals exist for the sake of man. The tame for use in food, the wild, if not all, at least the greater part of them for food and for the provision of clothing and various instruments. Now, if nature makes nothing incomplete and nothing in vain, the inference must be that she has made all animals for the sake of man. And so, in one point of view, the art of war is a natural art of acquisition, and the art of acquisition includes hunting, an art which we ought to practice against wild beasts and against men who, though intended by nature to be governed, will not submit, for war of such a kind is naturally just. Of the art of acquisition, then, there is one kind which by nature is the part of the management of a household. In so far as the art of household management must either find ready to hand or itself provide such things necessary to life and useful for the community of the family or state as can be stored. They are the elements of true riches for the amount of property which is needed for a good life is not unlimited. Although Solon is one of his poems uh, in one of his poems says that no bound to riches has been fixed for man. But there is a boundary fixed, just as there is in the other arts, for the instruments of any art are never unlimited, either in number or size, and riches may be defined as a number of instruments to be used in a household or in a state. And so we see that there is a natural art of acquisition which is practiced by managers of households and by statesmen, and what is the reason of this? Uh, so section nine is where we're moving next. Just checking how much we got left. One, two, three. Cool. Only a few pages left. There's another variety of the art of acquisition, which is commonly and rightly called the art, an art of wealth getting, and has in fact suggested the notion that riches and property have no limit. Being nearly connected with the proceeding, it is often identified with it. But though they are not very different, neither are they the same. The kind already described is given by nature, the other is gained by experience and art. Let us begin our discussion of the question with the following considerations. Of everything which we possess, there are two uses. Both belong to the thing as such, but not in the same manner. For one is the proper and the other is improper or secondary use of it. For example, a shoe is used for wear and is used for exchange. Both are uses of the shoe. He who gives a shoe in exchange for money or food to him wants one, does indeed use the shoe as a shoe, but this is not its proper or primary purpose. For a shoe is not made to be an object of barter. The same may be said of all possessions, for the art of exchange extends to all of them, and it arises at first from what is natural, from the circumstance that uh, some have too little, others too much. Hence, we may infer that retail trade is not a natural part of the art of getting wealth. Had it been so, men would have ceased to exchange when they had enough. In the first community, indeed, which is the family, this art is obviously of no use, but it begins to be useful when the society increases, for the members of the family originally had all things in, camp in common. Later, when the family divided into parts, the parts shared in many things and different parts and different things, which they had, had to give in exchange for what they wanted, a kind of barter which is still practiced among barbarous nations who exchange with one another the ne necessaries of life and nothing more, giving and receiving wine, for example, in exchange for corn and the like. This sort of barter is not part of the wealth-getting art and is not contrary to nature, but is needed for the satisfaction of men's natural wants. The other or more complex form of exchange grew, as might have been inferred, out of the simpler. When the inhabitants of one country become, uh, became more dependent on those of another, and they imported what they needed and exported what they had too much of, money necessarily came into use. For the various ne necessaries of life are not easily carried about, and hence men agreed to employ in their dealings with each other something which was intrinsically useful and easily, easily applicable to the purposes of life. For example, iron, silver, and the like. Of this, the value was at first measured simply by si size and weight, but in process of time they put a stamp upon it to save the trouble of weighing and to mark the value. When the use of coin had once been discovered, out of the barter of necessary articles arose the other art of wealth getting, namely retail trade, which was at first probably a simple matter, but became more complicated as soon as men learned by experience whence and by what exchanges the greatest profit might be made. Originating in the use of coin, the art of getting wealth is generally thought to be chiefly concerned with it, and to be the art which produces riches and wealth, having to consider how they may be accumulated. 
Indeed, riches is assumed by many to be only a quantity of coin because the arts of getting wealth and retail trade are concerned with coin. Others maintain that coined money is a mere sham, a thing not natural but conventional only, because if the users substitute another commodity for it, it is worthless, and because it is not useful as a means to any of the necessities of life, and indeed he who is rich in coin may often be in want of necessary food. But how can that be? Uh, how can that be wealth of which a man may have a great abundance and yet perish with hung hunger, like Midas in the fable, whose insatiable prayer turned everything that was set before him into gold? Hence, men seek after a better notion of riches and not of the art of getting wealth than the mere acquisition of coin. And they are right, for natural riches and the natural art of wealth getting are a different thing. In their true form, they are part of the management of a household, whereas retail trade is the art of producing wealth, not in every way, but by exchange. And it is thought to be concerned with coin, for coin is the unit of exchange and the measure or limit of it. And there is no bound to the riches which spring from this art of wealth getting. And, uh, uh, sorry, as in the art of medicine, there is no limit to the pursuit of health, and as in the other arts, there is no limit to the pursuit of their several ends, for they aim at accomplishing their ends to the uttermost, but of the means there is a limit, for the end is always the limit. So too, in this art of wealth getting, there is no limit of the end, which is, which is riches of the spurious kind and the acquisition of wealth. But the art of wealth getting, which consists in household management, on the other hand, has a limit. The unlimited acquisition of wealth is not its business, and therefore, in one point of view, all riches must have a limit. Nevertheless, as a matter of fact, we find the opposite to be the case. For all getters of wealth increase their hoard of coin without limit. The source of confusion in the near connection between the two kinds of wealth getting. And either the instrument is the same, although the use is different. And so they pass into one another. For each is a use of the same property, but with a difference. Accumulation is the end in the one case, but there is a further end in the other. Hence, some persons are led to believe that getting wealth is the object of household management, and the whole idea of their lives is that they ought to uh, ought either to increase their money without limit, or at any rate, not to lose it. The origin of this disposition in men is that they are intent upon living only, and not upon living well. And as their desires are unlimited, they also desire that the means of gratifying them should be without limit. Those who do aim at a good life seek the means of obtaining bodily pleasures, and since the enjoyment of these appears to depend on property, they are absorbed in getting wealth. And so there arises a second species of wealth getting. For, as their enjoyment is in excess, they seek an art which produces the excess of enjoyment, and they are not able to supply their pleasures by the art of getting wealth. They try other arts, using in turn every faculty in, manner, in a manner contrary to nature. The quality of courage, for example, is not intended to make wealth, but to inspire confidence. Neither is this the aim of the general's or of the physician's art, but the one aims at victory and the other at health. Nevertheless, some men turn every quality or art into a means of getting wealth. This they conceive to be the end, and to the promotion of the end they think all things must contribute. Thus, then, we have considered the art of wealth getting, which is unnecessary, and why men want it and also the necessary art of wealth getting, which we have seen to be different from the other and to be a natural part of the art of managing a household concerned with the provision of food, not however, like the former kind, unlimited, but having a limit. So now we've got this idea that, um, I mean, he's just talking about capitalism, right? So we have an unnatural, uh, unlimited growth of wealth, then we have a natural use of wealth to procure needs. Uh, household management is the term. All right. Part 10. And we have found the answer to our original question, whether the art of getting wealth is the business of the manager of a household and of the statesman or not their business. Visualize a uh, viz. I don't know what that means. V-I-Z dot. That wealth is presupposed by them. For as political science does not make men, but takes them from nature and uses them, so too nature provides them with earth or sea or the like as a source of food. At this stage begins the duty of the manager of a household who has to order the things which nature supplies. He may be compared to the weaver who has not to make uh, 
but to use wool and to know too what sort of wool is good and serviceable or bad and unserviceable. Unservice Were this otherwise, it would be difficult to see why the art of getting wealth is a part of the management of a household and the art of medicine not. For surely the members of a household must have health just as they must have life or any other necessary. The answer is that as from one point of view, the master of the house and the ruler of the state have to consider about health from another point of view, not they, but the physician. So in one way, the art of the household management, of household management, in another way, the subordinate art has to consider about wealth. But strictly speaking, as I have already said, the means of life must be provided beforehand by nature. For the business of nature is to furnish food to that which is born, and the food of the offspring is always what remains over of that from which it is produced. Wherefore, the art of getting wealth out of fruits and animals is always natural. There are two sorts of wealth getting, as I have said. One is the part of household management, the other is retail trade. The former, necessary and honorable, while that which consists in exchange is justly censured, for it is unnatural in a mode by which men gain from one another. The most hated sort, and with the greatest reason, is usury, which makes a gain out of money itself and not from the natural object of it. For money was intended to be used in exchange, but not to increase at interest. And this term interest, which means the birth of money from money, is applied to the breeding of money because the offspring resembles the parent. Wherefore, of all modes of getting wealth, this is the most unnatural. So interest is the most unnatural means of getting money, money for money. Number 11. So, uh, well, I wanted to mention real quick. So we had the story of Socrates. Uh, oh, sorry. The, the clouds, right? Where we had uh, the father wanting to eliminate debts. Maybe he was justified because it's just a, nat a natural way to make money on the other people's part. Connecting things. Aristophanes, the clouds. All right, number 11. Enough has been said about the theory of wealth getting. We will now proceed to the practical part. The discussion of such matters is not unworthy of philosophy, but to be engaged in them practically is illiberal and irksome. The useful parts of wealth getting are, first, the knowledge of livestock, which are most profitable in where and how, as, for example, what sort of horses or sheep or oxen or any other animals are most likely to give a return. A man ought to know which of these pay better. Pay, okay, which of these pay better than others, and which pay best in particular places? For some do better in one place, and some in another. Secondly, husbandry, which may be either tillage or planting, and the keeping of bees and of fish, or uh, fowl, or of any animals, which may be useful to man. These are the divisions of the true and proper, uh, true or proper art of wealth getting and come first. Of the other, which consists in exchange, the first and foremost, uh, the first and most important division is commerce, of which there are three kinds. The provision of a ship, the conveyance of goods, exposure for sale, these again differing as they are safer or more proper, uh, more profitable, rather. The second is usury, the third service for hire, uh, of this, one kind is employed in the mechanical arts, the other in unskilled and bodily labor. There is still a third sort of wealth getting intermediate between this and the first or natural mode, which is partly natural, but is also concerned with exchange. Visualize, I think V-I-Z dot means visualize. That's, that's the only thing I can think of. Visualize or like uh, imagine the industries that make their profit from the earth and from things growing from the earth, which, although they bear no fruit, are nevertheless profitable. For example, the cutting of timber and all mining. The art of mining, by which minerals are obtained, itself has many branches, for there are various kinds of things dug out of the earth. Of the several divisions of wealth getting, I now speak generally. A, minute, uh, a minute consideration of them might be useful in practice, but it would be tiresome to dwell upon them at greater length now. Those occupations are most truly arts in which there is the least element of chance. They are the meanest in which the body is most deteriorated, the most servile in which there is the greatest use of the body, and the most illiberal in which there is the least need of excellence. Works have been written upon these subjects by various persons, for example, by uh, Charis the Perean and 
Apollodorus the Lim uh, Limnian, who have treated of tillage and planting, while others have treated of other branches. Anyone who cares for such matters may refer to their writings. It would be well also to collect the scattered stories of the ways in which individuals have succeeded in amassing a fortune. For all this is useful to persons who value the art of getting wealth. There is the anecdote of Thal uh, Thal Thales the Milesian and his financial device, which involves a principle of universal application, but is attributed to him on account of his reputation for wisdom. He was reproached for, this pro uh, for his poverty, which was supposed to show that philosophy was of no use. According to the story, he knew by his skill in the stars, while it was yet winter, and that there would be a great harvest of olives in the coming year. So, having a, a little money, he gave deposits for the use of all the olive presses in Chios and Melitus, uh, which he hired at a low price because no one bid against him. When the harvest time came and many were wanted all at once and all of a sudden, he let them out at any rate which he pleased and made a quantity of money. Thus, he showed the world that philosophers can easily be rich if they like, but that their ambition is of another sort. He is supposed to have given a striking proof of his wisdom, but as I was saying, his device for getting wealth is of universal application and is nothing but the creation of a monopoly. It is an art often practiced by cities when they are in want of money. They make a monopoly, monopoly out of provisions. There was a man of Sicily who, having money deposited with him, uh, brought up all the iron from the iron mines. Afterwards, when the merchants from the various markets came to buy, he was the only seller, and without much increasing the, the price, he gained 200%. Which, when Dionysus, uh, Dionysius heard, he told him that he might take away his money, but that he must not remain at Syracuse. For he thought that the man had discovered a way of uh, making money which was injurious to his own interests. He made the same discovery as Thales, 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 that uh, they both contrived to cr create a monopoly for themselves. And statesmen as well ought to know these things. For a state is often as much in want of money and of such devices for obtaining it as a household or even more so, hence some public men devote themselves entirely to finance. Part 12. Of, ha of household management, we have seen that there are three parts. One is the rule of master over slaves, which has been discussed already, another of a father, and the third of a husband. A husband and father, we saw, rules over wife and children, both free, but the rule differs. The rule over his children being a royal over his wife, a constitutional rule. For although there may be exceptions to the order of nature, the male is by nature fitter for command than the female, just as the elder and full grown is superior to the younger and more immature. But in most constitutional states, the citizens rule and are ruled by turns, for the idea of a constitutional state implies that the natures of the citizens are equal and do not differ at all. Nevertheless, when one rules and the other is ruled, we endeavor to create a difference of outward forms and names and titles of respect, which may be illustrated by the saying of Amasis about his foot pain. Foot pain. I don't know what that means. The relation of the male to the female is of this kind, but there, but there the inequality is permanent. The rule of a father over his children is royal, for he rules by virtue both of love and of the respect due to age, exercising a kind of royal power. And therefore, Homer has appropriately called Zeus, quote, father of gods and men, end quote, because he is the king of them all. For a king is the natural superior of his subjects, but he should be of the same kin or kind with them, and such is the relation of elder and younger, of father and son. You know, it's interesting, we're getting all this image of, imagery of father and son being one with each other, you know, and this is about three, 400 years before Jesus uh, exists. And so maybe the idea that Jesus would be one with man um, would just make sense in, in this kind of culture, right? So, so arising out of a culture where uh, gods are seen as human-like, having the greatest of all gods become one, that'd be very interesting. Pasta Mike, you've joined us here. I'm reading Politics by Aristotle. I'm actually about to end if you want to stick around for the last couple minutes. Uh, I've got one more section, section 13. Uh, I don't know how long ago you said that. All right, part 13. Thus, it is clear that household management attends more to men than to the acquisition of inanimate things and to human excellence more than to the excellence of property, which we call wealth, and to the virtue of free men more than the virtue of slaves. 
A question may indeed be raised whether there is any excellence at all in a slave beyond and higher than merely instrumental and ministerial qualities, whether he can have the virtues of temperance, courage, justice, and the like, or whether slaves possess only bodily and ministerial qualities. And whichever way we answer the question, a difficulty arises. For if they have a virtue, in what, in what will they differ from free men? On the other hand, since they are men and share in rational principle, it seems absurd to say that they have no virtue. A similar question may be raised about women and children, whether they, they too have virtues. Ought a woman to be temperate and brave and just, and as a child to be called temperate and intemperate or not? So in general, we may ask about the natural ruler and the natural subject, whether they have the same or different virtues. For if a noble nature is equally required in, bo in both, why should one of them always rule and the other always be ruled? Nor can we say that this is the uh, that this is a question of degree, for the difference between ruler and subject is a difference of kind, which is the difference of more and less never is. Yet how strange is the supposition that, uh, that the one ought and that the other ought not to have virtue. For if the ruler is intemperate and unjust, how can he rule well? If the sub, uh, if the subject, how can he obey well? If he by if he be licen, uh, licen, licentious, uh, licentious and cowardly, he will certainly not do his duty. It is evident, therefore, that both of them must have a share of virtue, but varying as natural subjects also vary among themselves. Here, the very constitution of the soul has shown us the way. In it, one part naturally rules and the other is subject, and the virtue of the ruler we maintain to be different from that of the subject, the one being the virtue of the rational and the other of the irrational part. Now, it is obvious that the same principle applies generally, and therefore almost all things rule and are ruled according to nature. But the kind of rule differs. The free man rules over the slave after another manner from that in which the male rules over the female or the man over the child. Although the parts of the soul are present in all of, uh, in all of them, they are present in different, different de degrees. For the slave has no deliberative faculty at all. The woman has, but it is without authority, and the child has, but it is immature. So it must necessarily be supposed to, uh, be, supposed to be with the moral virtues also. All should partake of them, but only in such manner and degree as is required by each for the fulfillment of his duty. Hence the ruler ought to have moral virtue and perfection, for his function, taken absolutely, demands a master artificer. And rational principle is such an artificer. Uh, the subjects, on the other hand, require only that measure of virtue which is proper to each of them. Clearly, then, moral virtue belongs to all of them, but the temperance of a man and a woman or the courage and justice of a man and of, of a woman are not, as Socrates maintained, the same. The courage of a man is shown in commanding of a woman in obeying, and this holds of all other virtues, as will be more clearly seen if we look at them in detail. For those who say generally that virtue consists in, good disposition, in a good disposition of the soul, or in doing rightly, or the like, only to deceive themselves. Far better than such definitions is their mode of speaking, who, like Gorgias, Gorgias, enumerate the virtues. Uh, is that the same character that we saw, uh, I think, in one of the dialogues in one of um, the one of the dialogues in the Republic? We, we saw that example. All classes must be deemed to have their special attributes, as the poet says of women. Uh, oh, as the poet says of women, silence is a woman's glory. Hmm. But this is not equally the glory of man. The child is imperfect, and therefore, obviously, his virtue is not relative to himself alone, but to the perfect man and to his teacher. And in like manner, the virtue of the slave is relative to a master. Now, we determined that a slave is useful for the wants of life, and therefore, he will obviously require only so much virtue as will prevent him from failing in his duty uh, through cowardice or lack of self-control. Someone will ask whether, if what we are saying is true, uh, virtue will not be required also in the artis uh, artisans, for they often fail in their work through the lack of self-control. But is there not a great difference between the two cases? For the slave shares in his master's life, the artisan is less uh, closely connected with him, and only attains excellence in proportion as he becomes a slave. The meaner sort of mechanic has a special and separate slavery, slavery and whereas the slave exists by nature, not so the shoemaker or other artisan. 
It is manifest then that the ma master ought to be the source of such excellent in this uh, excellence in the slave and not a mere possessor of the art of mastership, which trains the slave in his duties. Wherefore they are mistaken who uh, wherefore they are mistaken who forbid us to converse with slaves and say that we should employ command only for slaves stand even more in need of admonition than children. So much for this subject. The relations of husband and wife, parent and child, there are several virtues. Uh, what in their intercourse with one another is good, what is evil, and how we may pursue the good and escape the evil will have to be discussed when we speak of the different forms of government. For inasmuch as every family is a part of the state, and these relationships are the parts of a family, and the virtue of the part must have regard to the virtue of the whole, women and children must be trained by education with an eye to the Constitution. For uh, if the virtues of either of them are supposed to make any difference in the virtues of the state. And they must make a difference for the children grow up to be citizens and half the free persons in a state are women. Of these matters, enough has been said. Of what remains, let us speak at another time. Regarding then our present inquiry as complete, we will make a new beginning. And first let us examine the various theories of a perfect state. So uh, politics, book one, we're looking at the nature of a state. Obviously a lot of questionable things, uh, things that will be expanded upon by later authors, I'm presuming. Um, so it's interesting because it's like we we have Aristotle as, uh, we've been on this kind of pedestal as like a great thinker, but here he is discussing slavery and like the role of slaves um, within a society. And I know that it's like cultural. I know that this is like what he's growing up with. Um, and in a way, this is further evidence that like, what's right or wrong, it doesn't matter where it comes from. It's just, if you value human well-being, some of these things go away. But if you value um, the status quo, just keeping things how it is because it's worked, because we've survived based on this way, I think it's more complicated. So um, yeah, it's a, this was a little bit troubling to read, honestly, of um, politics. A bit old fashioned, as I might say. Um, next, if you're if you're interested in what's coming up next, ooh, my next reading will not be from Aristotle. Um, I'm actually moving on. So I've finished five out of the first eighteen chunks of the first year. The next one looks a little bit more in depth. It's like thirty pages and then sixty four pages. Ugh. It's going to be uh, Plutarch: The Lives of the Noble Grecians and Romans. Now, I'll be honest, I might start this, uh, this history, and then I might find summaries. Uh, if, if the next thing that I read is from the New Testament, um, okay, so it's the, the Gospel according to St. Matthew, and then the Acts of the Apostles. So we got two books out of the Bible will be next. I mean, I'll probably read like a new standard version. Um, this book, the Bible is not included in the set. However, I do have... Uh, the Interpreter's Bible, which is like a, a, a studious version of the Bible, and it's got the books and their com complete um, uh, King James Version uh, style in there. I might read that. I might read the New Standard Version. I might read something that's free but easier to read um, for that later. So if the New Testament, the Gospel according to Matthew, and then the Acts of the Apostles, if that's what's next, you'll know that I have, I'll have skipped Plutarch. Uh, and so it, it's, it's a history of the lives of uh, Lyc Lycurgus, Numa Pompilius, Lycurgus and Numa compared, right, both of them compared, then Alexander, then Caesar, uh, then Caesar. So there's a lot of big histories. I'm, I'm sure it's really important. It's just long, and I'm sure it's going to be boring. However, it might not be boring. It might be incredibly interesting. We'll give it a shot. All right. Until next time. <laughs>